Good evening, everyone. I know many of you are familiar with the building, but just in case, the bathrooms are in the front lobby and across from the office. Um, and and women are both out there. And the kids' corner, if you hadn't already been guided to that, out this door and across the hallway, it's the community room. The kids' corner is in there. Um, if you would like to participate with arts and crafts, there are a few kids in there now. Um, I know sometimes if they do finish a project, they kind of like to run down here and show their parents that they completed it. So you might see kids running back and forth, but they're in there and they're supervised by two students with student government in high school. Um, welcome, thank you for being here tonight. I know it's St. Patty's Day, it is absolutely beautiful outside, and apparently there's a basketball tournament too starting tonight. So um, I appreciate you being here against all those obstacles, and I can't thank you enough for just participating and engaging in our series that we started. My name is Angie Ross. I am a family and community engagement coordinator for the district. My colleague, Denny Morrison, um, we have been very busy. Denny handles the secondary grades. I'm with the primary, but we have a crossover and um, all the fun that we need to do for the district. So we have been working together and um, establishing those partnerships and opening up that communication with family, like providing events like Parent University. This is our third Parent University, and it's, it's a special one, actually, because it correlates with what is going on in the middle school currently with their student curriculum and the Sydney Middle School Against Bullying campaign. So um, it's very special with our presenters tonight and what is going on in schools to provide this parent presentation um, to help engage that piece with it. Um, on the tables, there is a save the date flyer that lets you know the dates of the upcoming parent universities that we're also having. And there is a big eight by 10 flyer, or eight by 11 of Jeff Beely and um, Dr. Childers will go into this a little more, but with the finale to this campaign that's going on, um, we have a speaker coming in, and he is putting on a fabulous show for our students, our parents, and he's doing staff training as well. So that is a quick flyer to save the date for him in May, which will be here before we know it. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Childers, she's an assistant principal here at Sydney Middle School, and um, she has been behind the efforts of making this night happen as well, and every effort that's been going on for our students in the school. Good evening, and welcome to Sydney Middle School. This year, we have implemented an anti-bullying campaign why. We've worked very hard to help our students understand what bullying is, and what will mean is not. Through classroom lessons and activities, our students have learned how to report incidents of bullying, how to be positive bystanders, and how to treat others with kindness and respect. As we move forward as a school and a district with steps to address community concerns regarding the various types of bullying, we wanted to take an opportunity to help parents understand what resources and, act and actions are available to them outside of the school system and the most efficient way to report concerns that occur in school. With that, we have invited Amy Semendinger, Shelby County Juvenile Court Liaison, and Heath Hegeman, Shelby County Juvenile Prosecuting Attorney, to present the best ways to combat this important issue. With that, I'll turn it over to Heath. Thank you. Got it. Thank you uh, for having me tonight. As mentioned, my name is Heath Hageman. I'm with the local county prosecutor's office. I've been there for 19 years. And in those 19 years, I've learned a few truths that I wanna share with you. One is you're in a great community and you have the support of great schools. And I mean that because I have an opportunity in my job to talk to a lot of different administrators, to talk to a lot of different teachers, and also to deal with different schools and how they put things together. And I applaud the city of Sydney schools, their administration, and everybody here who's trying to make a difference. We're all here tonight in support of this idea that they want to give you supports so that you as families and your children um, get the most out of not only the educational process, but when things like bullying and cyberbullying come up, that you also have the resources 
know where to go and who to talk to when those things happen. So uh, I'm just one part of it. Certainly there are things that happen in schools. As mentioned, there's administration and teachers. Obviously the schools have resource officers. There's the broader law enforcement in general. But my part of it is, is what do we actually do if something rises to the level of bringing a charge or if something rises to the level of going through court? And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that and also some definitional stuff so that we know what we're talking about. So let's start here with what is bullying? Well, bullying is not every bad thing that happens to a kid in school. Um, you know, one of the things I want to say is that bullying has a specific definition. And uh, we all still have to be good parents, good guardians, good teachers. We all have to uh, make sure that, that uh, we're giving kids good support. But not everything actually meets the definition of bullying. If two kids collide together in the hallway and one of the kids drops his or her books, and as a result of that, they feel like they've been wrong, that's not necessarily bullying. Bullying, unfortunately, has more serious definitions. So it's often used to describe all encounters that leave us unhappy, uncomfortable, unwelcome, or unsatisfied. Kids can experience mean or unkind behaviors from others, but to meet the definition of bullying, there are specific criteria. Repeated actions or threats. Bullying is not a one-off event. Bullying is not one kid using a slur or a bad name with another kid. Bullying is a repeated activity that happens over time. We're often looking at a power imbalance. This can be physical or social. Okay, well, obviously, if one kid who's two grades older than another kid is bigger, uh, you know, physically more imposing, well, that can be a power imbalance. Another can be if you have, you know, socioeconomic issues. If you have one child who uh, either has, you know, more means and more more assets or believes so and uses that to bully other people, well, that can be a power imbalance too. And then lastly, intention to cause harm, and that can be physical or emotional. A lot of what we see with bullying happens on cell phones, computers, tablets. That's how a lot of bullying happens. A lot of it happens outside of the school, as you well know. And what that means is you have to be vigilant. Certainly there are things that happen within the walls of the school. You're here at the school to learn more about this. But there are many, many things that happen on a Saturday night that you also have to be vigilant about. And what I mean by that is you can't expect the school to do all of the parenting. You can't expect law enforcement or the prosecutor's office to solve all problems. Be vigilant about what your kids are doing, who they're running around with. Look at their social media. I take the position in my home, or I did anyway, when my kids were younger, I bought those phones, they belonged to me. And what I mean by that is, I think we have a right to monitor what our kids are doing and what's on their phone, what they're talking about, who they're talking to, what they're looking at, and what they're saying. So that leads into this. What is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is bullying that takes place over digital, devices like cell phones, computers, and gaming systems. Well, the truth of the matter is that when uh, two of our distinguished guests and myself were kids, we didn't worry about that stuff. Bullying was calling names on the playground or doing things face to face. Well, and specifically, our esteemed guests in that regard are Chief Fry and Captain Tangeman, uh, your county sheriff and the captain, one of the captains over at the police department. We're old enough that when we were young, those things didn't happen. Okay, well, now kids have very powerful computers at their fingertips all the time. And they can do and say things, sometimes, without thinking about it, with, uh, with impunity, and sometimes with anonymity. In other words, they can say and do things that they don't actually have to put a voice or a face to. They can do it from behind a computer, uh, behind a cell phone. That becomes very dangerous. That cell phone, that tablet, that computer is a very powerful device. I've often said this, never in the history of the world have we had the opportunity to do so much research and find out so much information. From a learning standpoint, it's the best time to be a student in the history of the world. Also, at no point in the history of the world have we had access to devices who, that can defame, demean, 
and hurt other people by using terms and saying things that are very hurtful. Some kids wouldn't dare say things that they would text. Some kids wouldn't dare show, uh, pass along pictures in person that they would pass along via a device like this. So it's also very dangerous time. And that's why parental involvement and sometimes law enforcement and sometimes the prosecutor's office has to get involved. Some examples, bullying, repeatedly teasing, calling names, repeatedly hurting someone physically, harassing someone due to race, religion, orientation or disability. Cyberbullying, creating fake profiles of someone else, spreading false information, repeating, repeatedly sending threatening or harassing messages or texts, sharing personal or embarrassing photos electronically. Ladies and gentlemen, if you think that there's not a problem with kids sending suggestive, nude, or partially nude pictures, you're kidding yourselves. I see it. It goes through our office quite often. It is um, pervasive. Okay, kids do that. And I think that uh, I really sometimes get into, involved with parents, and they're like, well, I can't believe little Johnny did that. Well. Get more involved. And, and I don't mean that to sound like I'm just lecturing. I mean, look at what they're doing. Look at who they're talking to. Set parameters on their phones. Don't let them talk to people that you don't know at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I guess what I'm saying is all of this starts at home. Every bit of this starts at home. By the time things get to school, or by the time it gets to the daylight hours, a lot of this stuff is going all through grades or classes or friends or cliques or groups. And then the school is almost the aftermath. In other words, a lot of this happens at home and then gets into the school. So the first line of defense for a lot of these type of things are moms, dads, guardians, older brothers and sisters. Don't wait for the teacher to call you and say, hey, this happened, this got reported. Know what is going on in your own home with devices used by your own children. Why do people do it? Well, I'm gonna read most of this or summarize most of this, but there's more reasons than we could ever map out as to why people do this. But, you know, here's some ideas. Feeling socially or academically inadequate. Uh, low self-esteem, anger issues, being a survivor of bullying yourself. Okay, let's focus on that last one. All of us know that if you've been the victim of something, there's a higher probability that there's going to be a cycle there, a cycle of violence, a cycle of whether it's sexual assault, whether it's bullying, whether it's cyberbullying. That's a pretty common trend that we see, which is victims, especially victims in childhood, become perpetrators, all right? Um, I, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't explain to you all of the psychology and the science behind it, but I know it's a truth. I know it's a fact, okay? So obviously, the more that we can do to be vigilant about keeping those cycles from starting, the more that we can do from keeping those cycles from repeating. Anger issues. Well, again, without reading everything up here, let me just say this to you. If you have a child or you know a young person who's got anger issues and they seem to be lashing out, take a look at what they're putting on their phones and their tablets because it's just obvious, and I think most of us recognize and understand this, but if they're lashing out, if they've got a, maybe a mental health problem or an unresolved issue or something that they need to discuss in counseling, they're probably also lashing out on their devices and maybe in ways and maybe even more prevalent than what you see in person. So just be aware that that is, I call it a trigger, Okay, I think that's probably an appropriate word for that. But it says here, anger issues that remain uncontrolled may lead to behavioral outbursts. Okay, well the issue with the behavioral outburst is there's a victim on the other end of that outburst, 
or there may be a victim on the other end of that outburst. Low self-esteem, yeah, I think it also goes without saying that if you don't feel good about yourself and if that's the way that you're portrayed or the way you feel about yourself or the way others talk to you, that you're likely going to be one that's going to lash out too. And I would suggest to you this, these types of things, kind of the mental health behind some of this bullying and cyberbullying, boy, there's lots of good people and resources that can help with that. If you have a child that's been a survivor of bullying, has anger issues, low self-esteem, any type of those mental issues, you know, fight through that stigma of they don't need help or I can fix it at home. Um, there are professionals that can and should assist and they can get to the core problems or issues that may lead to them getting themselves in trouble for this type of activity. What can parents do? Well, let's start with school. When incidents occur at school, child, report it immediately to the office. Now, I would go a little bit further than that. The office obviously means the center of administration. Well, it may be appropriate in some instances to go to a teacher. It may be appropriate in some instances to go to a resource officer. It may be appropriate in some instances to go to a guidance counselor. I think the office, I would expand that a bit to include more than just the people in the highest levels of administration. I would say that the child should be comfortable enough to go to those people in immediacy to the situation who can actually help. Parent, report to the school using the designated reporting system for Sydney City Schools. Okay, here's the takeaway there. There is a designated reporting system for the City of Sydney Schools. It is a resource at your disposal. It is an asset that you have. It is a tool that you can utilize. Get to know about it. I'm sorry, get to know it, understand it, and if the need arises, use it. It says these should be the immediate first steps, reporting by other means, delays the resolution process. Here's what I think that means in part. There's a problem at school. Neither Johnny nor the parent has reported it to school, but I went down and talked to my favorite neighbor. Okay. Actually, neighbors can give advice, and you can have people that you lean on. Here's what I think this is trying to say. Your neighbor down the street can't fix a problem at school. Just go through the channels. When incidents occur or start outside of school, here's my takeaway. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the biggest number of these incidents. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where most of this starts. It doesn't all start at school. A lot of it starts outside of school. Report the incident to the appropriate authorities, law enforcement. Okay, well, if you're in school, ultimately there, you have a resource officer. If you live in the city of Sydney, you have the city police department, and obviously they have detectives and line officers and other people that can, will, and do investigate these crimes when they occur. Report incidents that occur via social media to the proper platform. If it happens on TikTok, there's a way to report that on TikTok. If it happens on Snapchat, there's a way to report that on Snapchat. Now that's not necessarily a law enforcement tool per se. That's a let's get it stopped. Let's stop this from happening and other people seeing it, being victimized by it, or being a part of it. In other words, go to the platform itself and ask them to stop it if it's inappropriate. Keep documentation of the incidents that's called evidence. When you finally get down the road to somebody like me and we prosecute a case and we have to bring an action in juvenile court or adult court in some instances, we need evidence, okay? So evidence means I've got a screenshot of something that was on a phone or I've got the phone itself or I've made copies of something. That's what they're talking about there. Now up? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah.
It should just be down towards. Hello, Susan, family. My name is Tiffany Rigg, and the communications coordinator for City City Schools. And I'm here to provide you with a quick how to on reporting student harassment and bullying. First thing you want to do is go to our website, citycityschools.org. Uh, there are some menu, drop down menus at the top, including our district, our schools, four families, and how do I. So click that how do I, and there's going to be some quick um, access points for, for families. So you can have money to develop a child's lunch account or apply for free and reduce meals. Uh, even enroll your student, but the very bottom of that drop down menu is report student bullying. Simply click that. So, again, citycityschools.org, click how to work at the top, and click report student bullying. That's going to open up our public school works um, reporting platform. They provide the legal definition of bullying. Uh, take a chance to read through that, and then if you feel like your situation is reporting, much as that. Um, or it's close enough to that, go ahead and click continue, and it will bring up the form for reporting. Um, you can report anonymously on this form. Um, parents, staff, uh, bystanders can report on behalf of other students. Um, the thing that we ask though is that you provide as much information as possible. The more information you provide, the better able we are to handle your situation and to maybe find a resolution. So um, while you can report anonymously, it may stall efforts to solve the problem. So the contact information uh, is the first thing. The, um, you can select your school, and then you can use this box to fill in uh, a description of the, of the situation. You uh, can even upload attachments, photos, videos, files that support um, uh, your report of the situation. And then once you're complete, you click Submit at the bottom. I do want to say that we will be launching a new website. At the end of this year, beginning of, of the summer, and um, while you know this process of going to our website, but how do I and reporting to the police is, is the process you should use through the remainder of the school year. I want to give you just a little preview of what it's going to look like when we do switch over to the new website. So here's a mock up of our website, and you can see that there are three sticky buttons to the right. Those sticky buttons stay there uh, as I'm scrolling through the main page. <laughs> Top one is for enrollment. The second one is for school lunches, menus, and the third one that looks like the police siren is the report student bullying. So at any point, you go to our website, click that, and it will take you right through. If you're on another page within the new website, you will click the menu, and under connect, there's a link for report student bullying. So those are the ways on the new website that you can report it. But again, on our current site, how do I report student bullying? Thank you. Good day. Told me to start pushing buttons again. So here we go. <laughs> Hello, City City Schools families. My name is Tiffany Rank, and the communications coordinator for City City Schools. And I'm here to provide you with a quick how to on reporting to. Remember, I told you I'm from a different generation when you were seeing that. Okay. Role of law enforcement. School, re school resource officers can assist with issues that occur at school. Now, again, I'm not trying to belabor this point, but I want to say this very plainly and very clearly. School resource officers cannot deal with, on Saturday night, you know, Jimmy said to Bobby, you know, I hate your guts and all that stuff. They can't deal with the stuff that's happening outside of school. I recognize, and I'm telling you and I agree, that I believe that more happens outside of school than inside of school for one simple reason. You have structure at school. You're going from class to class. Things are happening. You're working on things. You're working on projects. So just as a practical matter, more of this stuff is going to happen outside of school. But if it does happen inside of school, that's where you need to go. That certainly is a great starting point as a school resource officer. Parents can contact law enforcement, law enforcement with concerns that occur outside of school hours and off property. Law enforcement officers can help parents determine if there is probable cause to pursue legal involvement in juvenile court. 
That's specifically where I come in. Parents should provide evidence or documentation to a law enforcement agency to support concerns. The better that you present your concerns and your case, the better chance you have of law enforcement being able to do something with it. I don't know who said it. I don't know who did it. I don't know when it happened. I don't even know what was said is not going to lead to a result that you're gonna like, okay? So the better evidence that you have, the more homework that you've done, the more information that you can gather and provide to law enforcement, the better that you're going to feel about the idea that somebody has listened to me, somebody has heard me, and somebody's doing something about it. Role of juvenile court prosecutor past possible legal involvement. I determine if this probable cause to approve a charge based on evidence by law enforcement. Well, as much as I'd like to take credit for this process, it's really law enforcement that does all the heavy lifting and the hard work. Law enforcement is very good here, and they do a really wonderful job of bringing cases that are well-researched, well-investigated. Uh, I can tell you this, that it's very unusual for law enforcement officers to bring things to the prosecutor's office that are never going to stand up in court. They genuinely care about what these charges look like, whether they're viable, and they're trained. They're highly trained to understand what a violation of the law is. So by the time I get it, what I'm really saying is most of the hard work is done. It's really my job to then pick it up there and say, good job, guys. You did a nice job then to take it to the courthouse and make sure it goes through the system, which involves a charge, a juvenile court case. If there's an adjudication or an admission, then it involves juvenile court involvement, meaning certain penalties or uh, certain programming that they have at juvenile court. Review the cases with law enforcement to, to determine if additional evidence must be gathered. That's true. Approved charges related to bullying and cyberbullying. That's true. It can involve telecommunications harassment. It can involve disorderly conduct. It can involve assault. It can involve menacing. It can involve menacing by stalking. It can involve unruly charges. I know, I said more than it's on the list. I'm just telling you this is what I do for a living and I understand the charges. Some of them can be very, very serious. And I'll, I'll tell you another thing too. It's not a big leap or a big step from, you know, I'm saying inappropriate things to suddenly I'm sending inappropriate pictures. That absolutely is a nexus or a step that we often see. Some of those can be very serious felony cases with very serious results. In fact, some of those can involve uh, and if it's a sexual offense of some nature, it can involve, you know, a tier program where you have to, if you're convicted of those things, register as a sex offender, okay? It can involve potential stints at rehab. It can involve, you know, records that may not be able to be expunged. These can have very serious implications on some of these types of charges. Again, especially if it also involves what we call a sexual offense. What can parents do? Help children understand the difference between mean, unkind behavior and bullying? We all encounter mean behavior. Those situations are not bullying. That's what I was saying before. Know your child's friends, their families, and where your child spends time. Encourage your child to support other students at school, invite someone new to sit with them, walk with someone to class, etc. Here's what I say. What can parents do? Know who your kids are friends with. Know where your kids go. Know, have rules for the devices that they use. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but my kids understood that it was a privilege to have a device, that they had the device because it was provided by their parent and that their parent had a duty and a role as the parent to protect them. And that included knowing at all times who they were talking to and what was on their device. And I'll tell you what, folks, people laugh at me for that. They say, oh, no, 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 not my Johnny. 
My Johnny has a right to do whatever the heck he or she want, or he wants to do. My Johnny, I'm not going to be that way. My Johnny will resent me. My Johnny, you know, my Johnny wouldn't do that anyway. You know when I hear that? Not necessarily when I'm walking around Walmart. I hand that, hear that when Johnny's standing over here next to me in juvenile court because they're always so surprised. Everybody's surprised. I had no idea that they would send those kind of pictures or talk to people in that way. Okay, and I get it. I, under, I do understand we are not with our kids 24-7, 100% of the time. And I'm not naive enough to not understand that things can happen that are out of our control. But I'm telling you, there's a theme. When it gets to the Heath Hegeman juvenile court stage, there's a theme. And the theme typically goes like this. I had no idea. I guess I wasn't paying attention. I didn't understand. I would have never guessed. That it's always, not always, but more often than not, it starts like that. And if there had been more parental controls in the beginning, if there had been more parental observation, if there had been more parental involvement, I think a lot of those things that happened would not have happened. Most social media platforms prohibit accounts for children under 13. Not everybody agrees with that. I do. And again, the reason that we talk about stuff like that and they have age limits is once you get into high school age kids and older and you get into adults, okay, then you get into freedom of speech, you get into I can do and say and talk about and look at whatever I want to. Well, 12 year olds probably aren't ready for that, right? 12-year-olds probably aren't at a maturity and an education level where they can handle that. Electronic devices are the property of parents. End of discussion. Frequently check your child's phone, computer, gaming system, and other devices. Encourage children to block, unfollow, delete those that are mean to them, either in person or via social media. I would also suggest, if you don't know them personally, if this is somebody saying, hey, I'm a 13-year-old from Utah, Maybe not. Maybe they're a 45 year old, you know, I'm not gonna use the word, but may maybe they're somebody who's trying to entrap your student or your child. Maybe they're somebody pretending to be somebody they're not. Encourage children to, okay. Encourage your child to spend less time online. Studies indicate children that spend a significant amount of time online, gaming, testing, and texting, and social media may be it increased risk for anxiety, depression, and other behavioral health concerns. Help students understand that even passive or indirect participation in bullying or cyberbullying is not acceptable. Examples, secretly taking pictures of other students and posting them on social media intended to insult, degrade, or embarrass. Recording a fight or physical assault and sharing it with friends on social media, sharing a screenshot of bullying behavior, or sharing inappropriate pictures they have received. I'm not suggesting that those are necessarily Sydney students. I don't recognize those people and that might be something posted off the internet, but I can guarantee you that those examples there have happened in this school system. Report your concerns directly to social media platforms. All social media platforms have reporting mechanisms for bullying and cyberbullying. In addition to any other steps, these incidents must be reported directly at the source. Social media platforms can take immediate action to suspend accounts. I'm not suggesting to you that that's the end of the world or the be all end all. I'm not suggesting to you that that fixes or solves all problems or that that stops everything. I think probably everybody in this room knows better, but it's a start. If enough people complain about what happens on social media, if enough people report inappropriate activities, pictures, statements, and ideas, things can change and they do change. Instagram, you can report someone through the feed or directly through their profile. Click on three dots next to their name, tap report, and follow the instructions. TikTok, go to the user's main page, click on three dots next to their name. A menu will pop up giving you the option to report or block. Snapchat, 
To remove someone's account, press and hold on the Snapchatter's name, tap the icon in the top corner, or tap more and press report. To report a snap or story that you see, press and hold it and put and report snap. By the way, do you guys realize that those things only exist because consumers demand it? In other words, I'm not suggesting that they do that because they're trying to be good citizens or because they think it's always the right thing to do. Most often, when things get reported or there's a mechanism to report thing, it, things, it's simply because users and parents and community members complain. That's how that gets done. These are some additional resources for parents. You can just take a look at that for a second there. The bottom line here is what I want to talk about. Shelby County has programming in place to increase access to services and provide support both at home and at school. School's only one part of the puzzle, right? Um, there's mental health counseling. By the way, school's a big part of the puzzle. School can provide resources and help, everything from charging to school guidance and all that sort of thing. But even beyond the school, as it mentions here, Shelby County has all kinds of mental health facilities, mental health programs. You can, I don't know if you know this, you could actually call the juvenile court without ever a charge pending and say, hey, uh, what, what programming do you have if my student is engaged in this kind of conduct? Or what counseling do you have if my student has this kind of an issue? They will be more than happy to help you over at the juvenile court to get you to professionals that can help your child, whether or not your child is a victim or if your child's engaged in activity that he or she shouldn't be engaged in. That programming does exist in Shelby County, and I would suggest that without a lot of digging, you could find a lot of different resources to help. It's your turn. I'm gonna turn it back over to Amy Simmendinger. Hi everybody, my name is Amy. Um, I'm the juvenile court liaison for Shelby County. So I work with all of our eight school districts in Shelby County and our juvenile court. I do work with Sydney quite a bit. And my role is anytime a kid comes to court, whether that is for an unruly charge, underage consumption and disorderly conduct, our court is very committed to education. And we take a look at grades, attendance, and behavior. If there's concerns in those areas, then I get involved. I'm not a probation officer, I can't arrest anyone. Um, but I do work with students and families to make sure that they are um, improving grades, attendance, behavior, um, especially for our high school kids getting their credits so that they can graduate, and making sure that our families are getting connected with the services and supports that they need. And one of the programs that I run is the IMPACT program. And probably 11 years or so, our United Way in Shelby County came to juvenile court and said, if, if there was one thing that you felt like we could fill a gap in Shelby County and funding was, was available, what would, you, um, what would you envision for our community? And um, at that time, we were seeing um, younger and younger kids coming into um, children's services care, um, being referred to juvenile court, and we had just had an eight-year-old in juvenile court who was there on the domestic violence charge. In my world, that's a heck of a temper tantrum, um, but we had to deal with it. Kids that young don't belong in court, they need help. And whether our kids are, are being bullied or some kids are the ones that are being unkind to others, those kids need support. So we created the IMPACT program. It's a pretty unique collaboration within our county and it would not exist without our United Way. It's available to kids in as young as preschool through 12th grade or as long as they're still in school. We do have some students in our opportunity school that are a little bit older than 18 as long as they're still in school. It is free to kids and families. Insurance isn't a factor, income status isn't a factor. And I work with families to connect them with the agencies that we, we can uh, contract with. We have three different agencies, soon to be four, that we can refer families to. Uh, families have access to individual counseling, family counseling, case management, sometimes support in the home, support at school. Whatever a child or family needs, it's very individualized. 
Um, but our goal is to kind of help cut through that red tape. It can be very overwhelming to find help for your child. And the reality is mental health services can be very expensive. My hope and my goal is that someday, you know, when we talk about our kids' health, we talk about vision screenings and hearing screenings, and we take them for their well checks. But when we start talking about mental health wellness, everyone takes a giant step back. And, and my hope is that someday that is, is as much commonplace as everything else that we do for kids and is easy to access. But unfortunately, right now it's not. So in Shelby County, we're incredibly lucky to have this program. You just have to be tied to Shelby County in some way. We have some families that are open enrolled from outside counties into our school districts in Shelby County. And we have some families who live here, but maybe do an online program or um, open enroll to a neighboring county. As long as you reside or attend school in Shelby County, you're eligible for this program. Again, it's free for families. Um, there are flyers on the table, and I believe on the snack table as well, with my office number on it. I am more than happy to talk with families if you have concerns. If you know someone that might benefit, please take a flyer with you. Um, I want this resource to be used, and I also help direct families to, um, we have something called a diversion assessment team, which can help. We do have a lot of resources, but when you're struggling and your child's struggling, it is really hard to pick up that phone and know where to start, and I would, I would really love to help families figure out where they can get that support and that help. And I and a lot of people and I do a lot of presentations together, um, but I, I love this, this slide. Remember there's no such thing as a small act of kindness. Every act creates a ripple with no logical end. I think the really easy conversations are where we sit back and say someone else needs to solve this problem. The hard conversations are where we all sit down at the table and say, yeah, we need, we need our administrators and our teachers and our school board to be a part of the solution. We as parents, and I'm speaking as a parent of, of a city city school student and a, and a graduate from two years ago, we have to be having a seat at the table as well. Our community partners need to be a part of this conversation, and community members who don't even have kids in our, in our schools need to be a part of this conversation. Um, I, I also facilitate a parenting class, and the, and the reality is our kids' brains are not fully developed until they're 25 years old. And our kids are watching us. You know, when we hop on social media and attack and berate a stranger because we disagree with them, our kids with their undeveloped minds and poor impulse control don't see any difference in, in that and, and how we, they treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis. When we go out to eat and aren't very kind of waitress because they weren't fast enough with our food, they don't see any difference between that and, and maybe how they treat the people that are kind enough to prepare their food every day. How we as role models in this community model behavior for our kids across the board, at Walmart, at Kroger, wherever we are, it really does make a difference when kids are watching. Um, and I think that we all need to have a seat at the table and be a part of the solution. Uh, we can't just say it's one person's responsibility and we have to set, we technically have our, our, our cortex is developed, we need to set that example for our kids and lead by example across the board. So um, our resources are available to you guys, please reach out to me. Um, my phone number is on there. I would love to help connect you. Or if you have said if you know a family that might benefit that could be here tonight, please share that number. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Um, and just remember that every act that we, we demonstrate for our kids does have our goals. Again, do you want to come up?